Amen. With that being said, turn to Romans the 15th chapter. I'm going to read one verse out of here and we're going to begin a Bible study today. Romans 15 7. We also have the screen up, so if you want to read along with it. 15 7. 15, 7. 7. 7. No. Yeah, 15 7. Romans 15 7. If you have it, say amen. Amen. Let's read. Wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Amen. We use that one verse today. We're going to use it within the context of how it was written, but generally we're going to use it based upon this it's a it's a it's a truth that God wants to send to all of us as members of the body of Christ on how we receive ye one another how we receive ye one another. And by just looking at the verse, there's some information that we can pull from the verse in and of itself. It says, wherefore, now anytime you see wherefore, what does it, what does it uh, prompt us to do? Uh, ask the question, what is it there for? What is it there for? And generally, if we want to know what it's there for, why it's where, what's wherefore, what do we do to find out? Read the verses beforehand. Amen. So we go beyond that or go the verses previous to that to really find out what in fact um, what, what is being made reference to. So I'm going to read verses uh, 1, uh, verse 1. It says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now I'm going to make some, I'm going to make some statements here today for time's sake that some of you may, uh, may understand uh, to the extent that when we studied it before, um, just for the sake of where we're going uh, as it pertains to this singular topic of wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Because this is something that God wants us to be very, very aware of, how we receive ye one another. Reception is very important. How many of you know this term, this thing called um, uh, first impression, how important first impression is? You ever see somebody for the first time? You ever see somebody for the first time? And for the first time, a lot of people, this is how we do it. The first time I meet you, there's an impression that you give me that either I can cut you off forever or I can be a part of what you're about forever. Just based upon what, how I received you the first time. You ever notice that with some people? You just get this bad vibe with some people. You know what I mean? And because you get that bad vibe, you kind of, okay, I don't want to have to deal with that person because I see what they're about, that, that type of a thing. Well, when we're looking at the word of God, God begins to let us know that that's not how we deal with people. And that's not how we receive people. And it's not based upon who we used to be. It's based upon who we are in Christ. See, this is so important for you and I to understand how our reception to individuals are supposed to be changed based upon who we are in Christ versus who we are before we first trusted Christ. A lot of us know how we receive people. Have anybody got any instructions on how you receive people from either your parents or school or different things like that that had was extra biblical, was outside of scripture, that had nothing to do with your salvation. It probably was before you were saved and how you dealt with mankind or how you dealt with individuals before you received salvation from, you know, from different, uh, different parts of towns or, pe or different um, financial groups or different things like that. You just had a way that you dealt with them based upon what somebody else had told you that wasn't the word of God and it wasn't even you when you were saved. It was that old man. And that's something we always want to be aware of. That old man. And that old conversation. And that old mindset. <clears throat> Why should we be aware of that old mindset? It's always there. It's always there. Trying to influence us. Trying to influence us all the time. It's always there. So what, what's good or bad about that? It's corrupt. It's corrupt. That's bad. Well, what's, why is that not good? It doesn't give glory to God. We need it, to learn how to put it off. We don't. It doesn't give glory to God. Look, we live in our life. We're talking about Jesus Christ gave his life for us to give his life to us to do what? Live his life through us. To live his life through us. So now if I'm using the old mindset, is that Christ living through me? No. Am I receiving you as Christ would receive you? No. I'm receiving you how Leroy would have received you. I'm receiving you how Jeremy would have received you. You see, and, and, and then we have to look at it and understand that some of us may have had bad, you know, some upbringing that it may have been wholesome. I know I remember something that, um, that was taught to me as a child. I remember they just told me that just treat, treat people, you know, 
Not so much how you want to be. You know, you hear that one too. Treat people how you want to be treated. But also treat people how they treat you. Right. So if they nice to you, you can be nice to them. Hmm. Isn't that how the world, the Bible tells you? Isn't that how the world even treats each other? Absolutely. If I do you fine, if I do right by you, you do right by me and everything good. But what if you don't do right by me? I ain't going to do right by you. So now how, look how it gauge my conduct. Because we all have some form of fashion of how we look at things. Verse 15, verse, I mean, chapter 15, verse 1, with what we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now, I'm going to tell you this in context. In context of what's being made reference to here, I want you to truly know and understand that I see this as a transitional passage. It's transitional because you have to understand that the circumcision, the individuals that are saved in the church, those that are still um, trying to maintain the calling wherewith they are called. Mm -hmm. In fact, we're going to go back. I'm going to have to do this a little backwards than I imagined because I want to share with you what we're saying here. For, um, chapter 14. Go to 14 for me. And 1. Romans 14 and 1. Because this is a continuation of chapter 14. See, it's still talking about that weak individual. But we want to identify who the passage is talking about as being weak so we'll just at least understand the context. And then we're going to understand the overall view of how we actually receive one another. But I want to show you who it was talking about specifically when it was written. Because this particular dynamic, it's great that God used this as an example because it was what it was existing at the time. This isn't existing at the time, but there's something else that is existing right now that we use this same form of doctrine on. Okay. Oh, we get that. You'll see what I'm talking about. This, I, we're going to share right now what was existing at this time that cannot be reduplicated. And a lot of people don't understand that, that during that transition where um, Israel is diminishing or falling, when they're falling, that little flock is falling and diminishing and they're getting weaker because their program with God is getting is diminishing and God is not giving them an additional faith and they're standing there to a certain extent trying to figure out what's God doing and Paul has all the information and Paul is writing things and they're trying to say, well, Paul is writing some things that's kind of hard to be understood because it's really not coming to them, it's coming to Paul, but God is giving Paul the information to instruct them as they're diminishing, they are weak. These individuals here, um, based upon the, the manner in which they were saved, some of them were observing the Sabbath day. Some of them had a code of a diet that was specific to what God told them they should eat. And because they were called in circumcision, they couldn't change and say, okay, now I'm body of Christ. I can eat anything I want. I'm going to put, no, God said every man to do what? Amen. Abide in the calling wherewith ye were called. If you were called in circumcision, you remain in circumcision. Right. But guess what? All the circumcision just didn't leave and go away and fall off the face of the earth. Guess what they were doing historically? Or chronologically. Hey Amen. They were still living on the earth at the same time as the increase of the body of Christ. So you have these two different segments in the church that were actually dealing with God's word at that particular time. That's very crucial, important for you and I to understand. That's my phone. <laughs> we'll get that in a moment. Mm -hmm. But we see that we have that same diminishing of that those group of individuals at the time the body of Christ is increasing that we definitely need to always be aware of. And if we're aware of that, get my phone, turn it off. If we're aware of that, it will cause us to greater understand some things that are going on here. So let's look at um, Romans the fourteenth chapter, and, and our topic today is where wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ received also received us to the glory of God. So in Romans 14, 1 says, Him that is weak in the faith received ye, but what? But not to yeah. doubtful disputations. Now even here, when he's talking about receiving one another, he says, these individuals are to be received, but not to doubtful disputations. It's not a situation whereas... Yeah, it's not a situation that you would... Receive this individual just for the sake of argument. And believe me, it was a lot of things that they could have a conflict about at that particular time because it's going on to mention a few of them. One person saw it this way and another person saw it this way. You're saying you of God, I'm saying I'm of God, but why is God doing it that way and over here God is doing it the other way? I'm really of God, yes, I'm really of God too, but why are you doing it like that? But I'm doing it like this. Oh, you, you see what I'm saying? This is happening on the earth at the same time. We can't say that today. 
That's right. I've seen the brother use that particular passage to try to, um, to try to justify why the Seventh Day Adventists are right in doing what they're doing when they try to observe the Sabbath day and put people back under the law. Because it's just the way they're interpreting the word of God. God is honoring them too. If somebody's trying to put you under Sabbath day and put you back under the law, are they doing it unto God today? No. Absolutely not. If somebody back here was honoring the Sabbath day and, 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 do, and eating certain meats, were they doing it unto God? Absolutely. Absolutely, because that cry chronologically, that's what they were doing when the particular dispensation of the grace of God began to manifold itself. And God said, you can't just hop over here into full information of what Paul is doing because your circumcision, you'll eventually just diminish. And the diminishing is something that is undertaught in grace circles. The fact that God doing something with a group of individuals that they had to actually diminish off of the scene so that you couldn't see them anymore while God is doing something that he's increasing and giving full in revelation all the way to the point we have the revelation today. You know, the revelation was fulfilled in time past, but we interpret what's going on as it pertains to Paul's message different than how it was being interpreted right here because it was being transitioned. Progressive revelation, even in Pauline epistles. Right. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak does what? Yes, what is that? Are we doing that today? Do we have this distinction in the body of Christ today? You eat all things, you eat just herbs. Not at all. No. But was they doing it back then? Absolutely. Was God honoring it back then? Absolutely. So you have a dynamic you have to understand that took place in the early church that doesn't take place today. And in spite of that, God is telling them to receive ye one another. It was important that they begin to understand what was going on because they needed to know how to receive each individual that they were dealing with. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another one who is what? Weak. Eateth what? Herbs. Now this is how we find out who we're talking about. The weak brother... What does he eat? Herbs. If we're talking about weak, we're going to contrast it with strong just for the sake of finding the better word. Because the revelation is coming to him. He eateth, huh? He eateth herbs. He eateth herbs, the weak, right? And the strong eateth all things. Both in the body. Both of these in the body. Let's go a little further here. Let not him that let not him that eateth despise him which eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him which eateth, for God has what? God has received him. So in other words, what is going on back here, both of these individuals are received of God even though they, have, they are doing two totally different things. This is something that we want to be always able to know because when people go back to these verses, you need to know exactly what was happening and how some of these things don't transition over. However, our reception to one another still remains the same. And that's what we're going to get into. I'm going to read a few more dynamics out here, then we're going to get back to what we're doing. But we just want to show the, the context, because we took it out of this passage, we want to show the context of which it was written, so we'll have a better understanding of how we transcend it into what we're doing today. Because you notice in Pauline epistles, it, sometimes it doesn't say stop doing the thing, you'll just have to know that some things fall off. You remember we were talking about that? Do we still water baptize today? No. Do we water baptize today? No. Where does it say stop water baptized? Does not. And, and we have to understand that some people say Paul says that I, I'm glad that I baptized none of you. Paul says that I'm glad that I baptized none of you. Does it say that? Yeah. But does that mean stop baptizing? Stop water baptizing? No, that doesn't mean it. That doesn't mean it, but we see that water baptism was put to the side. When he was a child, he thought of the child, he understood the child. He what? He spake as a child, but when he became a man, what did he do? Put away childish. Some of those things were put away. 
In the beginning of his ministry, he was water baptism. When he became a man, he put away water baptism. I don't know when he did it, why he did it, but he's put it away. Now I know why he did it. Right. So some things you'll see that have been put away. This particular identity thing, as it pertains to those who um, perceive one day above another and those who esteem every day alike, that has been done away with. Why has it been done away with? Because those individuals have diminished. They're no longer on the scene. So that's something that we want to be very careful of there. So that's what we're going to share about that. You kind of get what I'm saying there? Absolutely. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with as it pertains to this. Now let's deal with the topic at hand, which is verse 7. Romans 15, verse 7. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now, this is something important. If I'm going to be received, if, 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 we, if it's talking about me doing something based upon how I've been received, let's first verify that. Turn to uh, Colossians 2. Let's verify that we've been received first. Because we have to make sure that we are the individuals that the text is making a reference to. Sometimes people don't verify that they're even the one. There's a verse in Romans um, that says, um, it talks about um, all things work together for good for them that love the Lord, for them who are the cause according to his purpose. Does that work for everybody? No. Who does it work for? Those who are in Christ. Those that are in Christ. We know, so we know that we have to identify how does I how do I apply to that? I know that I am, I love God because I am the called according to its purpose, because I did trust the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that what that's what qualifies me for that. But look at Colossians 2 6. As ye as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, what? <laughs> so this is making the reference to what, what have we done? Receive Christ. We have received Christ Jesus the Lord, and now our instructions is to do what? Walk ye in him. Walk ye in him. This is our identity. We have to understand. Because I have received Christ Jesus the Lord, now my instruction is to walk in Christ Jesus the Lord. I'm not walking in Leroy. This is something we talk about. It's on the page every day, but we have to know that when God's word is manifesting or bringing something to our attention, it's very important that we say it like God says it. He said, walk ye in him. That's what my extension is going to be my identity that I have in Christ. Turn to Ephesians 1. So I have received Christ. I'm I've accepted Christ. I've received Christ. And that's something we want to see. I before E accept after C. I have received Christ, and now we want to see I've accepted Christ, and those are terms are synonymous. We'll see that. But now look at Ephesians 1 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us what? Accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. So we see that we have been received of God. We've been made accepted where? We have to understand that our acceptance, the way that God received us, is because we are in Christ. That's where our acceptance is at. And that verifies this particular truth that we're trying to go forth with. And we just laying the groundwork for it because when we get into rolling with what has been manifest through this truth, we're going to definitely see that we're going to see some people are going to have to line up with what the word of God says as it pertains to receiving people. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now, when you were accepted in the beloved, were you doing everything that was right in the sight of God? No. no. However, God saw fit to take all of your reproaches and put them on Jesus Christ. You know what your reproaches is? Everything. Everything, everything. Basically, boys, to everything. There's no because everything about us was reproachable. So in other words, the reproach is that thing that would keep you separated from somebody. So God took everything that would keep us 
um, reproachable or keep us separated from somebody, that we wouldn't have fellowship with somebody, that no, somebody wouldn't receive us. God took all of that and he put it on Jesus Christ. So now when God put everything that was wrong about us on Jesus Christ, he gave, uh, he did what was right and gave, uh, he, uh, he gave us what was right in Jesus Christ so that he would receive us unto himself. So this is how the reception took place. God took our reproach, put it on Jesus Christ, gave us that which is good, um, and now God receives us based upon what Christ has given us. That's the principle we all know. That's the transfer. He who knew no sin was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. So now we see exactly what God manifested in order to, see, to, to, to make us accept it before him. Turn to Genesis. Genesis 4. We've been accepted in the beloved. And I'm just dealing with this term accepted for a moment. Genesis 4. Because we want to make sure we're on the same page as it pertains to all throughout history. See that God has been um, accepting individuals based upon something in our particular lifetime, in our particular dispensation, not gospel. He accepts us because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. In time past, this is what the acceptance was based upon. Look at this. Or, it, uh, or whether or not God would receive this individual. Look what he says here. Verse 7. Time table, we just use the one verse, Genesis 4, 7. He's talking to who? Cain, Cain you know, um, Cain and Abel offered sacrifices unto God, correct? Now Cain all comes up to, to God with a sacrifice that isn't sufficient. So he, uh, he goes up. Let's actually start at verse 4. And Abel... He also brought the first, uh, first, first things of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance did what? Fail. Fail. So now this is what his acceptance would be based upon. Offering the proper sacrifice. What did the proper sacrifice represent? Sure. The shedding of blood, that perfect... <coughs> See, back then you have to understand that people put a lot of stock in the sacrifice, but you have to recognize that the sacrifice was pointing to the cross. It was the extension of what God would do for you. And if you want to tap into what God would do in the future, you'd have to do what pointed to what God would do in the future. And that was that sacrifice. We get that? Because a lot of people, I, I know this gentleman who says that God, uh, God saved everybody at all times just based upon faith in him. Faith in the Redeemer, he says. Just right. faith in the Redeemer. Yeah, that's what he said. Let me tell you how let me ask you how good faith in the Redeemer would do if you would not offer the sacrifice that was re requested by God. How, how good would that faith in the Redeemer do? No good at all. No. You understand what I'm saying? See, God told them to do something. You can say you have all the faith in the world, but back then, if you had if your faith had no works, works to go along with it, that faith would be dead. So God, should, back then they had to understand that, yeah, I can say I have faith, but I also have to offer this sacrifice that points at the finished work that Jesus Christ would do in the future. So verse 7 of Genesis 4 says, if thou dost well, see, doing something. What does he have to do in this case? Offer a sacrifice. Shall thou not be what? Accepted. It's about acceptance. This is being accepted before God. And this is the extension about the contrast in time past. They had to do something to be accepted before God. Today, Jesus Christ has done something for you and I to be accepted before God. And this is what we want to understand, that we had to get that acceptance. So I'll finish out here. And if thou does well, and if thou does not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall, shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over thee. So if he, he offered the sacri perfect sacrifice, he had been accepted. If he didn't offer the perfect sacrifice, what was going to still be the problem? Sin. Sin. God, that reproach, Jesus Christ took the sin issue out of our way so that we could have that reception or be received of God. So understand that the reason we're received of God is because of what Jesus Christ did. So now we're getting this pumped up. We're getting to understand that we're received of God not because of any works that we can go back to... Um, to uh, our text, our original text, Romans 15, 7. 
we'll see that everything that we've done is based upon what God has done for you and I, what he's done for you and I, the finished work of Jesus Christ. We've been received because of what he's received. That perfect sacrifice that he's done is definitely in, oh man, I wanted to show you something here. Let me show you something. In fact, turn back to, turn back to Genesis 4 and 7. Genesis 4 and 7. I want to share something with you as it pertains to acceptance. Now scroll all the way, keep scrolling until it goes to an ASB. Just keep scrolling up. All the way, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. I think I got both of them on here. I might have took it off. Okay, keep going. Now go to the verse in ASB. Keep scrolling. To the same verse, Genesis 4 and 7. Stop. Genesis 4 and 7. Do you have it in your Bibles? You have it in your Bibles what Genesis 4 and 7 says? Yeah. Yeah. This is important because, see, this is why the King James Version. Now, I'm not, you're not trying to preach, but every time I see an occurrence like this, I just want to share it with you. I just want to share it with you. You have to understand that. Our acceptance before God, realizing that we are accepted or received before God, is our springboard to why we receive others. And it's always been that way. And when you don't recognize that you're accepted and God receives you, you're accepted before God, if something is hampering that truth, what God's purpose is won't work in your life. If something is saying other than you're accepted before God, you're, you're all right, but you're really not. There's some things you have to do. If it's giving you some false information as it pertains to your acceptance, it's not what the word of God says. Why are we accepted? Because we are accepted and the beloved. Because we're accepting the beloved. So anything that points to the cross has something to do with the cross. If it doesn't accomplish full acceptance, it takes away from the cross work. True. In this case, in, in, in Romans, I mean, in Genesis 4, um, his offering pointed to the cross work. So once he would, that God said, if you offer that sacrifice, what he says over here in Genesis 4 and 7, if thou does well, shall not thou be accepted. And that's the case. What does it say here? Thou does well, shall it not be lifted up. Is that the same thing? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Is that, you have to see what we're saying here. See, this is the... American Standard Version. That's not what we're preaching about. It's a sidebar. The truth about how God has taken our sin and gave us his righteousness for the purpose of accepting or receiving us is paramount to our understanding. And anything that comes up against that truth should be totally dispelled. And you have to understand that. So now if you're having a Bible study with somebody and you're trying to teach them the contrast for why it's so important for us to be accepted when we attach ourselves to that cross, if you don't see that, this Bible is not going to teach it to you. The King James doesn't falter from that one time. I'm not a big proponent of all that um, manuscript evidence and all that text. That's one thing. That's fine. That, if they can do that, that's fine. The only reason I stand for King James only, because it's the only one that supports my salvation from A to Z. and never falters. Never. Mm. Never. You see, I'm going, my, my attachment to it is spiritual. Because I can, if I'm going to preach salvation as I know it because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, the only one that is going to maintain that all the way from the beginning to the end is the King James Version. And that's why I contrast this so you'll see that when that comes up. That's saying something that has nothing to do with the truth that's trying to be established. I spent enough time there. Let's go a little further. We can go back to Romans 15, 7. So we compare that and we begin to understand that, that that is, in fact, the truth there. That is, in fact, what has happened. If we receive Christ, we should receive others with the mind of Christ. How many of you believe that? Amen. 1 Corinthians 2.16. If we receive Christ, we should receive others with the mind of Christ. And that's what we've been made reference to here. We, when we receive others, we have to understand that my reception or receiving you or acceptance upon you is not based upon the old man. We were talking about that, but it's based upon this mind of Christ. And we'll turn here uh, very briefly. It's 1 Corinthians 2.16.
1 Corinthians 2.16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have what? The mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. Now you have to understand, it's making a reference to us having the mind of Christ. The moment you trust in the fact that Christ died for your sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, guess who mind you get? But guess how beneficial it is at that point as it pertains to your walk? Not at all. Not very much. Why not? You have renewed your mind by reading the word. Amen. So now you have the mind of Christ here. Now I'm writing this a little, but I want you to see the difference. I'm going to give you a gauge. But you also have that old mind. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, if we had a gauge here to 100 from zero, that old mindset would be about there, right? Because that's all you feel with. How about this mind of Christ that you just, just acquired? Mm -hmm. It's at zero. He's pretty much at zero. Well, I'll give him one because he, he believed the gospel. You got it, sir. So he's down here a little bit. He had one. Why isn't he as strong as him? Has he come to the knowledge of the truth? Because he hasn't come to the... See, he's saved. Amen. But that's why God says he doesn't stop that. It's his will that every man be saved. But he also wants him to come into the knowledge of of the truth. Amen. So in order to fill this up so that I can receive you and respond to you in the manner that Christ would, I have to, to begin to put on that mindset. We see what we're doing there? Turn Ephesians 4. I hope this helps somebody. It definitely helped me. Ephesians 4. We're talking about receiving people. I'm, to, I'm literally talking about somebody and how I receive them for the first time. I've never known you ever in my life. And you, that now our reception is one to another as brothers and sisters in Christ. This is talking about the church. He didn't go out. I'm going to share with you, what is our reception to individuals that I've saved? Who are? What is it? Especially, especially so we're still doing good to them but the idea is that we have a message for them we pursuing peace with them the, the fruit of the spirit is peace mm -hmm. but our main issue with a, a, a non-believer is that we're ministers of reconciliation be ye reconciled to God amen because he, we have to understand we can take their uh, reproach you understand we can take their reproach the fact that they're going to be contrary but if they don't have the mind of Christ or aren't spiritual led how far is that going to go so before we have a fellowship or some type of intimate contact with that person, we want to get them saved. As it pertains to, you know, dealing with them on a daily basis and in our reception to them as it, you know, see. But this particular passage talking about receive ye one another is making a reference to individuals that are saved. Yes, sir. It's talking to believers. Yeah. Receive ye one another. Ephesians 4, we're going to start at verse 22. Look what it says here. That you put off the former, I mean, that you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is what? Somebody said it, corrupt with deceitful lust. See, this old man, he has a whole lot of corrupt and deceitful lust. Do you think that would be influential if I'm receiving you based upon my corruptness and my uh, deceitful lust? But I'm a child of God. I'm a believer. But I'm still operating on this deceitful lust. And this corruptness. Because I haven't renewed my mind. So when I receive you and when I see you for the first time, this is how I'm responding to you. But I'm a believer. Is that how God wants me to receive you? No. no. So we have to understand that. We have to understand that this old man is based <laughs> upon the old way that people told us to receive other individuals. Some of, sometimes it may seem to have been good. I know you're going in, you should be going in the journals of your mind. Who taught you how to receive people? Parents. Your parents in most cases. 
your schools in a lot of cases, your churches, hopefully, if they were teaching sound doctrine, if they weren't teaching sound doctrine, guess what? Put that over here. Put it over here. I know it was in church and it was religious and it was churchy, but if it's not sound doctrine, it goes right over here because it was corrupt communication, which can be worse. How are you receiving people? Now, this is, a, this is a personal check. You have to understand, have I transformed my mind as it pertains to my reception of others, or am I still receiving individuals based upon my old mindset? I'm going to share with you something that I heard at the conference. Gentleman came up to me and he said, <clears throat> how you doing? I was like, come praise the Lord, brother. How you doing? Now, he was telling me about his friend. This is important why you don't. You have to be careful. You have to listen to everything that somebody says. He told me that an individual that he knew said, I would never listen to a black preacher. He said, I'd never listen to a black preacher. And he said, you know why? He said, because all of them are Democrats. He said, all of them are Democrats. And you know what? If they're a Democrat, that means that they don't believe in, um, they believe in that abortion. They believe in this distribution of wealth. They believe in this and they believe in that. And it, it just lumped us all the same. And then you know what he, then he went on to explain to me what he meant. You know what his question to me next was? This is going to blow you away here. You, you, you're trying to build it up, right? Are you a Democrat? Are you a Democrat? Oh, Not Brother, I let him know that we don't judge based on blah, 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 blah. He, you know, he didn't run the word God. He got it. You know what he told me? Are you a Democrat? Well, you see what I'm saying? See, we have to realize that our reception, how we receive that first impression is important. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now you not only connected me with your friend, but you also gave me the idea that you were coming from because you were, I don't know if you're going to take the information and go back to him. He's a Republican. Or he's a Democrat. Or what, what are you doing with that information? But what, what I'm saying is that that reception, how it was received, I could have dropped it right there. That could have influenced how I dealt with the situation. But if I thought that to be reproachable, could that have been reproachable? Absolutely. Second Corinthians, I mean, um, 1 Corinthians, I mean, Romans 15, I'm sorry. Romans 15, our original text. We're going to come back to Ephesians. Romans 15. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to, um, for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee did what? I mm -hmm. hope you get what that means. Mm -hmm. What I do and what you and I need to do as it pertains to brethren especially is to realize when something is said that can be um, interpreted as reproachable, we need to take that reproach for Christ's sake. And not to be upset about it. And I hope I'm not standing up here with you and think I'm saying it in the spirit that I was upset about it. I'm saying it to inform you that that is not how we ought to be. That should never have came into the picture. You understand what I'm saying? Because we're receiving each other in Christ. Turn to Galatians. Three twenty-eight, I believe. Very familiar verse, right? Pastor, would you see that as an unlearned question from the book of Second Timothy? Lets us know to avoid those unlearned questions and things. Or, I, I, or no? See, unlearned question is really the humility of the individual to answer the question to really say it's unlearned. I really don't know the answer. The foolish question, however, mm -hmm. I would place it in the category of that. Amen. Because it has absolutely nothing to do with what we should be talking about. Mm -hmm. It's outside of what God is doing. It's outside of wisdom. Yes, sir. It won't, the end thereof is not going to accomplish anything. 
it can lead into other detrimental things, but it won't accomplish yes, sir. anything that's good. Galatians 3, verse 28, verse 27 and 28. Look what it says here. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, is that water? No. How did you get baptized into Christ? By the Spirit. What did you do? Mm-hmm. What did you believe? Paul's gospel. Well, a lot of different stuff. We all on the same page here? <laughs> we believe that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day according to the scriptures. The moment we believe that for as many of us as have put on, I mean, have been baptized into Christ, we have put on Christ. All of us. If you're a believer, all I see in this room is Christ. I don't see, I sh- that's where my spiritual eyes should be. And why should I be looking out of my spiritual eyes, so to speak? Put Amen, because I'm trying to be in this new man here. If I look out of these eyes, I'm going to say anything. I'm going to tell on myself if, so, if I talk to somebody spiritual. But I should be looking, so I should see everybody in Christ. And look, at it goes on to define and give you more interpretation of the details about that. There is neither what? Juno Greek. Let's stop there. The ethnic racial issue should be abolished. It should be done with if an individual is in Christ. We have to get that. This, this, that's gone. That's been done away with Christ. My distinction as it pertains to my flesh is a done deal. I identify with those that have been put in Christ. There are only two different types of people on the earth today. Saved and unsaved. Believers and non-believers. non-believers. Same two groups. You see what I'm saying? However you want to phrase it. But if you're still looking at individuals based upon ethnic and racial situations, you have to know that you're still dealing with this particular deceitful, lust, and corrupt ass way of looking, uh, way of doing it. We see that? So now we go on. The next verse right here. Next, not even verses, next, next area. Nor Greek, there is neither what? Bind nor free. Now, what do you think that's talking about? Back then, it had a, a very Slave. specific dynamic. Slavery. Slaves are not you know, those Masters. that were free, and we could put that in our history and even see there. And back then, we can go to we can go to Philemon and see that it definitely had some some direct um, implications. But slavery isn't a big thing today, so how would we actually put that in? Well, you have to understand that generally back in, in, in the time where slaves were here, it was because a person owed a debt. And I didn't have the money to pay you, so I would have to be bond or your slave until I paid that off. Right. You know what I mean? Until my debt was paid off. So it really was a matter of, of, of almost finances. Someone who had the finances versus the individual that didn't have. It's almost classism. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So now if we understand and are, and are able to place these things in the positions that they ought to be in, we should recognize that in Christ there is no classism. There's no distinction based upon what you have and what you don't have. What you're going to get and what you're not going to get. There's no distinction in Christ. But, and I don't look at you or judge you based upon you having this or not having that. All of us have to look at each other from one vantage point and that's in Christ. Last but not least here. There is neither male nor female. nor female. This is a big one here. This is a big one. So many times and so many instances you see a separation of how people respond to people based on gender. gender. Whether they are male or whether they are female. How often, how, how important do you think that is as it pertains to reception of somebody? That can get this can get real out of hand. Believe it. You got some men in the church that greet all the women, but don't say nothing to the men. Mm. You see what I'm saying here? Mm. You have some women that greet all the men, but don't say anything to the women. Because this is something that they see. They're still looking at the dynamic of men and, re, of men and women as pertains to relationship and not as it pertains to being in Christ. All you see and all you should see is that individual. Being in Christ. Very important, very crucial 
um, situation that we all should recognize and understand. Turn back to Ephesians. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4.22. That you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed where? Scared of your mind. <coughs> this is where God wants us to renew ourselves as it pertains to receiving individuals. God wants you to start filling this up. How are some of the ways we can fill this up? That's it. Rightly divided. How many people read the word of God and don't get any spiritual benefit from it? I know a lot of people who do what they do. They do that um, through the Bible in a year. How many you think that really, in, in most cases, is really getting some type of spiritual benefit? No, not in most cases. It's like a novel when you try to read through it and blur through it in, the, in, in record time. You're not grabbing any spiritual significance or spiritual wisdom from doing just reading the Bible like it's a regular old novel or a regular old secular book. You can't even retain that information to reflect back on it when you need it spiritually if that's how you approach it. So when we're talking about getting this information so the mind of Christ will become a part of what we're doing, we're talking about being renewed in the spirit of our mind. And the reason we need to be renewed is because this old mindset it's contrary to who God wants us to be and how he wants us to respond and react to one another. We talk about this thing, the greetings. I'll read some more of this here. Last one. And that... Okay. <laughs> Battery going low. Just hit that. We, should, we might be able to stretch it out. And that you put on the new man, which is after God, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now it begins to let us know some things. Wherefore, put away lying, speak every man the truth with his neighbor, for we are members, what? One of another. See, this is the, the approach that God wants us to have, is that you are all members one of another. There's no disunity in the body. And all of those other elements that came as far as the, the, the racial and the ethnic mm -hmm. and the classism and the sexism, <laughs> all of those things are dynamics that the old man made a distinction to cause separation in the body. And we need to identify it every time it comes forth as something that is meant to try to cause some type of divisiveness. <laughs> but that is not how God would have us to operate today. So I'm going to share with you some of the ways that the Bible talks about grief. Turn to Romans 16. When you're talking about receiving someone, if you're physically talking about receiving somebody for the first time, <coughs> receiving them. Romans 16, 3. Now this is the letter, the letter Paul writes in, in Romans 16, chapter the third verse. Look what he says here. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ. He used the term greet. Verse 6. Greet Mary who bestowed much labor on us. Now he's writing the letter, but what is he actually telling them to do? Greet. To greet them, right? Verse 8. Though I factory, verse 7, salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are who, who of note among the apostles who are who also were in Christ before me. Verse 8, greet Ampius, my beloved, in the Lord. Verse 9, salute Urban, our helper in Christ, and Stachius, my beloved. You know what all these greetings and salutes mean? That means if I come into a place that I, and, and all these people that he's making a reference to just happen to be there, am I just going to act like I don't see them or just be cumbered with act like I'm doing something else and act like they have absolutely no, no bearing on my purpose of being here and, and it's not really something that I need to be uh, concerning myself with? It says to greet them. Greeting is to, make a, a, is to go out of your way to do some form of cordiality or some type of a term of endearment or something to, to let people know about your presence. I mean, to show people that you're excited about or happy about their presence. You can go into local restaurants and they give you a warmer greeting than some of the churches that, we, that you might be a part of. Oh, yeah. 
or some of the church folks that you might know, or some of the believers to be more specific. I go into a restaurant, this Mexican restaurant that I like to go to, my granddaughter always sent me to go get a home record junior. She loved home record junior. As soon as you go in there, you know what they say? Some of you know what I'm talking about already. Welcome to Mo's! Welcome to Mo's! I mean, as soon as you hit the door, they don't know you from Adam, but they show some sense of saluting, some sense of greeting you to let you know that you're welcome, you're invited here, and why shouldn't they? It's a business that's soliciting your money. So when you come in, why shouldn't they be excited that you came? Welcome to Mo's! Welcome to Mo's! Oh, woo, all of them. It's harmony. You'll get somebody coming to church and people hold their head down so I won't have to look at you and speak to you. <laughs> really? Ought it be that way? No. See, our personalities, listen, I understand that everybody's personality is not outgoing to want to say hello and all that. Because I'm telling you, I don't know what you're thinking, what, what I really am, but I'm really the one who can just do it out. I mean, the old me. That's, I can just do, I can self-contain. You know what I mean? I'm enough, I thought. But what you have to realize is that it's not about you. You're a representative or an ambassador for Christ. Christ. So now my reception is based upon who I am in Christ and not based upon who I used to be. So now I build myself up to go out the way. I'm like, whoa, ho, brother, how you doing today? Man, it's good to see you. Kim, how you doing? Praise God, I'm really happy to see you. You're a part of the body. Me and you guys have a special connection that's going to last for eternity. It's people of my own family I'm not going to be with. You. I'm going to be with you for eternity. Why am I not excited about it? Do you see what I'm saying? Sister right here. I'm, man, your son looks sharp in that suit. Oh, thank you. He looks sharp. You know, we, she, we fellowship on Facebook. I see that. Steve? Yeah. I mean, he was sharp. Sharp as a tack. I'm excited. It's, glad, it's, it's good to rejoice with, with people that's rejoicing, especially when they're in the household of the faith. I'm not going to just walk by her like, oh, okay, she's here today. I'm not going to. No, I love, I love the fact. And she's my little man. What you, what's going on? He getting big and everything. I remember she was pregnant with him. It's a joy to know that they, you know what I mean, that they're still a part of something, that they still care. And when they, when they come, we should salute and greet each other in that manner because it's something that we should be joyous about. When you greet and salute, it's not a, right, how you doing? And then it goes on to say, Titus 3.15. We can't do this today in this particular world. But the way you can, but you've got to be careful who you do it with. Somebody already knows it. <laughs> <laughs> Titus 3.15. Verse 15. This is how endearment, how endearing it, 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 it became. Well, maybe I got the wrong one. That's just talking about salute and greet them. But you know what I'm talking about, right? The Holy Amen. What is it? First Corinthians, I mean, 2 Corinthians 13, 12, maybe? 2 Corinthians 13, 12. I just want to show that for our, for our hearing. See that for our hearing there. 2 Corinthians 13, 12. Yep. Is that it? Yep. Look what it says there. Somebody excited here. Finally, my brother, finally, brother, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with what? And holy peace. I don't think they're going around slopping each other down or anything like that. But it's like, <laughs> oh, hey, brother, a little, mm. you're not really kidding, but you're like, hmm, to a sister. You know what I mean? That's, that's where the point where it could, you know, could manifest itself and it not be off kilter because the word of God condones it. That's how happy and intense it could be where it actually transformed into our person that we transfer that to each other. So don't think when I run up to you and give you that little hug or something, it's not all about who I used to be. You know, if I see Rondell, you know, it's just customary that when we see each other, we're like, hey, what's going on? We're like, what's good? I'm, I'm, you know, all this and all that. That's one thing. <laughs> you know, that's, that's one thing. And that could be tied into this. But now when I see Rondell, it's not all about that. It's about, man, praise God, you my brother in Christ, but I see Jeremy. I'm not trying to change my cousin. I'm not going to go through and be on stuff. like, man, this Jeremy. How you doing, my brother? I love you, man. You see what I'm saying? Now, people have to know and recognize that. 
The reason I didn't go back to Mike is just Mark is just y'all a little too far back right now. And I'm already out of breath. And Scott and Steve. Because I feel the same about all of you. But what I'm saying is that we have to begin to take on Christ in everything, especially first impression. And you can't change your first impression if you don't change your mind. I said a lot to say a little, but this is what I'm trying to get at today. Receive ye one another as God for Christ's sake. They didn't say it, God. Receive ye one another as Christ also received you to the glory of God. Your first impressions, your words and your deeds, what comes out of your mouth, your actions should all reflect who you are in Christ. Don't let down your guard as it pertains to that old man and let him be um, a reflection of who you are. A good way that we're going to have opportunity to, um, to, to demonstrate this truth is when we have our picnic, picnic the first week of August. There's going to be people coming from different various places that we'll have that opportunity to demonstrate how joyous we are that somebody cares enough about the word of God to travel over a distance to come fellowship with the church, the group of believers called Grace Family Bible Church. And we don't want to be that group that's cold, that's staying contained within ourselves, that's staying contained within that old mindset. We want to project the joy and happiness that's found in the Lord based upon this new man this new person that we've transformed into being, or are being transformed into. That's what we want to reflect to this world and to each other, to the glory of the grace of God. Any comments or questions?